Picking your favorite bird is what I imagine it's like to have to choose between your children, which is why I'm not doing that. Yet. But this year I've seen a little over 600 different species with fantastic trips in all months of the year. So instead of trying to decide which was the best bird or the prettiest or the rarest, what I'd like to do is do a little recap of my year in terms of my best favorite bird watching experiences. And there were many. Of course, for many birders, it's often the rarity of the bird that makes an observation special. For me personally, seeing a new species, exploring a new habitat, or simply witnessing a miracle of nature can come quite close in terms of overall excitement. So without further ado, here are my top 10 birding experiences of 2023. Enjoy. Number 10, the three wattled bellbird of Monteverde. Birding in Monteverde is popular for a reason. It's so popular, in fact, that even many non-birders who come to the country choose Monteverde as their first venture into the hobby. Did I say hobby? I mean sport, obviously. The whole town of Santa Elena just feels outdoorsy and oozes adventure. Monteverde tops Smithsonian's magazine's list of the best places to see nature after dark and has been called by National Geographic the jewel in the crown of cloud forest. There are excellent local birding guides and there's always something to discover with them. All of my visits this year were wonderful, including several encounters with the resplendent Quetzal. But finally seeing, not only hearing, the three wattle bellbird was definitely my top moment in this beautiful corner of Costa Rica in 2023. Number 9. Eurasian Hoopos in Serbia. Granted, our trip to Serbia this summer was not a birding trip. We traveled to Belgrade to meet good friends, who coincidentally were with me in the cloud forest of Monteverde to observe the bellbird. I like to disguise birding as many other different things, but try as I might, this does not qualify. However, a short trip saw us spending the night in our friend's lovely cottage near the town of Valjevo, and a little nature walk turned up one of my favorite European birds, the Eurasian Hupo, and not just one of them. The next morning, several more just flew by. One sat down on a tree limb in the garden. It was magical to me. And not only to me. My friend Vladimir, who has absolutely nothing to do with birds, told me that he'd have to grab a pair of binoculars to keep in the cottage. He really does. Number eight, here man's skull in Punta Arenas. Ah, oh, twitching. I admit, in Germany, I've been a little prone to doing it. To those uninitiated, twitching refers to the chase of rare birds, vagrants, lost little fellows that have little business being where they are. When a rare bird is reported on eBird or the German Ornitho.de, if I was close to it, I'd try to find it. That's part of the fun, isn't it? I'd never really go crazy, mostly because I didn't have a car when I lived in Berlin, and my job prevented me from going on insane trips that last longer than a single night in a random hotel somewhere on the weekend. But I could feel the urge to check out 2021's famous birds of northern Germany, like the Oriental Pranticle or the Spotted Sandpiper, funnily a bird that I see pretty much every day now. In Costa Rica, I don't yet have that urge, knowing that there's still a lot of the country's birds to be discovered with regular trips. But there was this one bird, a gull, a vagrant from California, a first ever record for Costa Rica, just across the Gulf of Nicoya. And supposedly it was just sitting there most of the time on the cruise ship pier. Still, I resisted, but of course, every time I was in Punta Arenas anyways, I stopped by the pier, pointed my scope at every single gull and tried to find it. Nothing, time and time again. Annoyingly, the gull had a tendency to spend its day really, really far out. So when I finally found it, the fifth or so time of trying, it was more of an annoyed relief than actually wondrous celebration of the bird. Still, I'm celebrating my first twitch in Costa Rica. Number seven, Corcovado. Corcovado? I mean, what else do I need to say? My brother was in the country and we drove down to Drake Bay with a stop in Ovita, a place I really love, and some birding along the way. Ah, that rhymed. Anyways, our plan was to spend a couple of nights at a ranger station in the national park. You can't really visit the park without the rangers, so we had to. What I'd imagined to be a remote hut in the rainforest was more of a remote hostel in a rainforest. Seriously, the place was much bigger and there were many more people than I'd imagined. But you can hardly call Corcovado overcrowded and the birding was excellent. Next time, I think I'll have to go into explorer mode and go on a specialized trip to see, I don't know, red-throated caracara or one of the specialties. But the close-up encounters with tinamus, ant birds, the putu, even the wood creepers were fantastic. We ended the trip to Osa with an excellent boat trip to the Rio Siepe mangrove. Oh, and we saw our first ever king vulture on the drive. So yeah, that was pretty good. Number six, 
Dota. Our following trip to Dota was very memorable for a few reasons. The road to the aptly named Los Quetzales National Park leads over the thankfully not so aptly named Cerro de la Muerte, the Mountain of Death. The place is interesting for birders. It's probably the most accessible paramo habitat in Costa Rica, and that means lots of endemic species and lots of life is for us. eBird refers to the place as Cerro Buena Vista now, and might as well, because the journey over the mountain pass is no longer deadly. For people at least. My car thought very differently the next morning, but first things first. So we continued our journey down into the tiny valley of San Gerardo de Dota, where we went to spend the night. First order of business in the morning was to find a resplendent Quetzal, which turned out to be a lot easier than expected. Just follow the crowds, really. It was a fascinating display, both by the birds and the crowds, and we had some other very cool encounters to go along with it. A torrent tyrannulate was doing its torrent tyrannulate things of hopping across the stream on the search for food. Flower piercers and hummingbirds were feeding in the gardens. A pair of long-tailed silky flycatchers were chilling in the trees. It was great, until we returned to the car and it didn't start. And there's not really a ton of mechanics in the area, so it wasn't until after dark that one showed up and, well, fixed it, sort of. Too late to actually leave. The owners of the hotel showcased the unbelievable friendliness and hospitality of Ticos and wouldn't even accept our money for the extra night we had to spend there. Unfortunately, the next morning, the car once again did not start. End of the story, we got to spend an extra day birding in the area and the mechanic returned the following afternoon. And as soon as the car was running again, we were out of there. Delayed by a couple of days, but we surely won't forget the experience. Number five, the wetland. I've talked about this before. Birding in Costa Rica isn't just about rainforests, cloud forests, volcanoes and beaches. In fact, some of the best birding in the country can be found in a different habitat. It's wetlands. That immediately makes sense to every birder out there. It's just not the first association people have with the country. The big three, if you want to call them that, are probably Palo Verde, Caño Negro and the nearby Medio Queso. But there are other cool spots as well near Ciudad Neli for example, close to the Panamanian border. I documented one of my favorite trips this year in video. Birding by boat in Caño Negro to find a yellow-breasted crake in the morning, followed by slow birding along the road to Medio Queso, topped off by the lesser yellow-headed vulture and the habirus that were waiting for us there. It was a beautiful day with great birds, nice food and lovely people. Honestly, I can't wait to go back. Number four, Mexico. I love Mexico. The food, the people, the culture, the landscapes. And now also the birds. Our trip there this year was a short one with family. And as those of you who watched the videos heard me complaining, without my scope. But still, birding in a region for the first time is probably one of the coolest things I can imagine. When even the common birds are completely new and exotic, I must have seen American robins many times during my trips to the US before I really paid attention. My morning trip to the botanical gardens in San Miguel de Allende was one of those bright-eyed wondrous mornings. Soaking everything in, looking really hard at every duck, at every sparrow, making sure that I correctly identify as many of the new birds as I can. The beautiful colors of the vermilion flycatcher kept fascinating me. And behind every corner there was another equally mesmerizing sight. Finally spotting the cactus wren on a cactus, where else? Or the canyon wren, you guessed it, in the canyon. I have to say, I think it was the combination of the completely different landscape, desert scrub, and all the wonderful birds, but the morning was magical. Number three, Germany's North Sea coast. This was everything but a new experience for me. But it was for Mari. One of my treasured childhood memories, spending multiple weeks every year at my grandpa's apartment on the island of Langeoog. To be able to share that, to see her experience it for the first time, was in and of itself just perfect. It feels like a different world up there. The air, the sea breeze, the salt, and of course, the birds. There are no cars on most of the German North Sea Islands and Langoog is no exception. To get around, we rented bikes, stopped here and there and everywhere, went to the beach, still too cold in May, drove all the way to the east end of the island and saw thousands of shorebirds, many of which among my childhood favorites. The Pied Avocet for sure, that fantastic elegant bird with the upturned bill. The Northern Lapwing, next year's German bird of the year, countless gulls and terns and godwits, what a day! And what an amazing celebratory dinner after two nights on the island. I ended up forgetting my tripod on the ferry, quite annoyingly already on the way there, but it did turn up again a couple of weeks later. I was still in Germany, so of course I had to go back to get it. 
And since it's not just around the corner, going back involved an overnight stay at a local campground and some more birding. A rare sitting sistola, my first ever bearded reedlings. Not for lack of trying, simply for lack of seeing. Nemesis defeated. Nice. Number two, the raptor migration. I'm from Germany. I'm familiar with bird migration. It's one of the things that makes the hob uh, sport so interesting here. Uh, now in winter it's all geese and ducks and if you're lucky, and I'm never lucky, you find a flock of those bohemian waxwings getting drunk on fermented berries. And even in Costa Rica migration is, well, quite obvious. Birding is great year round, but come October, November, all those cool little warblers start coming down to spend their winter. I knew that raptors migrated, of course, I just never put much thought into it. Probably invisible to those normal people who don't point their microphones toward the sky at night. Disclaimer, at some point I'll probably turn my microphone towards the sky at night and do a YouTube video about it, but I don't have the right kind of microphone, so while I don't, I just make fun of those who do to feel better, sorry. Anyway, I was wrong. Raptors migrate, and they do so by day. And along the so-called flyways, they do so in great numbers. I learned this earlier this year and started thinking, hmm. So when Mari showed me an Instagram post advertising a weekend of birding and migration season along the flyway, with the specific goal of watching the raptor migration, I was in immediately. And so we went. And I got surprised by the eclipse, the way that only birders get surprised by an eclipse. Because for normal people, an eclipse is kind of a bigger deal than some hawk migrating, but um, whatever. And then there was a storm, and there was a Cooper's hawk, and that was cool, and there were some other hawks, but yeah. Well, turns out that if you're a bird traveling long distance and there's an eclipse and then there's a storm, you just kind of stop what you're doing and you say, ah, maybe later. And maybe later was a week later, and Mari and I were still in San Jose, and we saw the numbers. I did a whole video on this, but man, it was spectacular. Number one, the pelagic trip. I know, for the seasoned bird in the US, pelagic trips are probably a regular pastime. Like Christmas bird counts and birding societies and all those other little cool things that you do. In Germany, pelagic trips are pretty much unheard of, I think. In Costa Rica, they happen more and more, as more people realize the enormous potential of the nutrient-rich waters of the country's coast. And for Mari's birthday in October, we happened to accidentally meet one of those people. Wilfredo Pollo Villalobos, who put me through a WhatsApp-based pelagic boot camp before we hired a little boat to head out. It was my first ever real birding trip from a boat on the ocean, and I was mesmerized. Completely lost and out of my element, but mesmerized. I had no idea what we were seeing, really, despite having checked out the birds in theory. Seeing them in person from a rocking boat with hundreds of them around you is a different ball game, let me tell you. I wasn't quite sure what was important and what wasn't, but then there was a different bird. All dark brown, like the Sooties, yes, but smaller and completely dark under the wing. A Christmas shearwater. Now, this was certainly one of the most unusual trips of the year for me, but definitely also one of the coolest. Thanks, Boyo, for making it happen. I'll see you very soon for the next one. This time, I'll prepare a little bit better for both the birding and the filming. So among the many, many outings this year, those were probably my 10 favorites. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe I forgot something. The thing is, great birding can happen everywhere and almost randomly. Finally seeing the surf bird this year at Playa Amosa was incredible, as were many of the beautiful evening walks watching the bat falcons hunt. Just last week, my brother and I went to see a black-capped night heron that was discovered in Dortmund, out of all places. And I could go on and on. One final thing that I'm really, really happy about, one of my favorite things probably of 2023 was launching Habiru Clothing. Hashtag cool t-shirts. Um, starting this channel, sharing our love, our passion for birds with you, um, taking you along with us on our trips. It's been a blast. And I'm sure 2024 will bring along many, many more amazing moments. So thank you everyone for watching, for commenting, for supporting us in our first few months. We appreciate you. I can't say that enough. Stay tuned, happy birding. Most importantly, Happy holidays. See you soon.